Welcome back to part four, in which discuss non-equilibrium states and processes in non-equilibrium environments. Now we discuss non-equilibrium environments. And this part is divided into two. And in this first half, we discuss non-equilibrium steady states. In this case, there's no time dependence in the system or in the environment. So the system will finally reach uh, a state where we do not have any macroscopic time dependence, and that is called NES. And, uh, but this is non-trivial and interesting. This is already non-equilibrium. And we discuss relaxation to NES, and probably you have heard about this very famous linear response relations. And uh, we also discuss the recipro reciprocal relations. And in my opinion, the reciprocal relations are the most important results in non-equilibrium statistical physics. Okay, so these are very, very standard and classical results, and we discuss this topic from our modern point of view. Okay, And the second half is very much biased by my own taste, and I basically discuss the work done by Naoto Shiraishi and Keiji Saito, and by myself. And I, I think this is interesting, but anyway, this is very much biased. Okay, anyway, let's get started and we start from non-equilibrium steady states. Okay, so this is non-equilibrium steady state. So we abbreviate this as N-E-S-S and we pronounce this as NES. Okay, and the general setting and typical models, well, uh, this is basically the same. We consider a physical system which may be large or small and whose, uh, which are almost in some stable states, J, uh, indexed by J, and there are omega, these microscopic, almost st stable states, okay? And the state jumps from one state to the other, probabilistically. And by EJ, we denote the energy or the free energy of this uh, microscopic state J. And we consider two cases uh, which define non-equilibrium environment. And the first case, this is very standard. Uh, the system is in touch with heat path, but there are more than one heat path, okay? And we uh, we call this alpha is the name of heat path. So alpha runs, runs from one to dot dot. And uh, we, we, we say that the, the, these heat paths have different temperatures. So this beta one is the inverse temperature of bath one, beta two is the inverse temperature of bath two, and so on. Okay, so this is a very typical non-equilibrium setting. And the second setting is the system, uh, the, we consider the case uh, where the system is in touch with a single heat path with inverse temperature beta, uh, but it's subject to a non-conservative force. I think we, we discussed this in, I think, part one. Uh, I think you remember, we talked about this kind of uh, weird this is a Penrose staircase. So in this case, you just go down, go down, go down, go down. And you're, you're go, you can go down forever. Uh, this represents this non-conservative force. This is periodic boundary condition, and you keep going like this. So uh, we consider this kind of a situation here. And uh, we do consider uh, the case where we have both uh, multiple heat paths and non-conservative force. And of course, we can think about uh, many other situations, like uh, we, we can think about a system which is in touch with two heat paths, no, no, two particle paths, two particle paths with different chemical potentials. Okay? And then in this case, a particle will flow from one particle bus to the other through our system. And you, you can think about that kind of situation too, and we can treat them uh, in almost the same manner. But anyway, uh, thinking about too many situations will make the story too complicated. So we, we concentrate on these two cases here. And uh, as before, the effective theory describing this kind of physical system is, of course, a Markov jump process with time independent transition rates we denote by uh, uh, this both face omega. Okay. And we assume again that all states are connected through non-vanishing omega. Okay, now uh, we discuss in more detail the properties that this omega should satisfy, and they are called, called local detail balance conditions. And I start with the case one, case one where we have multiple heat paths. And we, uh, alpha denotes the name of heat path and there are NB heat paths. And we say that this uh, part heat path alpha 
has the inverse temperature beta alpha. And here is one simplifying assumption. And we assume that whenever there is a transition between state J and K, so you can jump from K to J, so you can also jump from J to K, uh, there, then there is a unique heat path uh, whose number is alpha. So alpha JK is alpha KJ. And when the system makes this transition between K and J, uh, it only exchange heat with this heat, with single heat pass with number alpha. Okay. So uh, when something happens here, uh, the system exchanges heat with this path. And if something happens here, it exchanges heat with this path. Okay. And of course, uh, in, in reality, it may exchange heat with uh, two, more than two baths, and that can that can be treated, but uh, this assumption makes the business simpler. So we make this assumption. And then uh, the local detail balance condition that omega should satisfy is this. Whenever this is non-zero, then this ratio, then this omega jk is also non-zero, and the ratio satisfies this. So here we have something like the Boltzmann factor, but here we do have beta, which uh, is the inverse temperature of this particular bath, which is relevant to this transition, okay? And, as a, and this was in some sense proved in part one. Let's go back to part one. So this is part one, page 38. And so we consider this kind of situation and we repeat the previous discussion. And then uh, we can prove this relation for this uh, probability. And for some tau, for some nice tau, nice choice of tau, this p can be interpreted as our omega. And then this proves this proves this uh, assumed local detail balance condition. Okay, so this is the case one where you have multiple heat paths. Now, in case two, we consider system particles subject to a non-conservative force. So it's something like this. So here are particles and the force is acting, say, in this right direction. And of course, usually you have to have particle bath here and here because there's particle flow. But uh, we didn't want to have particle bath because it's sort of complicated. Instead, we take periodic boundary condition. Then particle moves here, here, and appears here, 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 here. So this is, of course, very unphysical. And I think you remember this picture from part one. It's almost like this Escher's uh, Penrose staircase where you go down, 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 down. But you keep just keep on going down, and you come back to the same position. And of course, uh, this cannot be described by usual potential, but you can write down the Newton equation. And in this case, probably you remember, uh, we can write we can prove this kind of local detail balance condition uh, by, by, by observing that locally speaking, uh, this non-conservative force can be regarded as usual uh, potential force. So uh, you get this condition, okay? And again, for suitable tau, you can regard, we can regard this uh, P as omega. So in this case, uh, we get I'm going back to part four, uh, we get this local detail balance condition, okay? Here again, the same factor. Now we only have single beta. And when you have hopping from K, to, if if you can change, go from state K to J, then of course you can also go from J to K and the ratio is given by this by this. And here you have this energy difference, difference plus this. And here J, I'm uh, sorry for the bad notation, but, uh, uh, this this makes uh, uh, this is for convenience, but I call by J I denote the displacement of particles in the direction of the force. So suppose that uh, in this case, if the force is in this direction, you can uh, if this hops from here to here, this uh, displacement is one. So you get you get plus F here, plus F here. That means now uh, this hopping is encouraged. Uh, on the other hand, if particle hops in this opposite direction, then this displacement is minus one. So this hop is discouraged by this factor, okay? And of course, this is displacement. Yeah, of course, this satisfies this anti-symmetry. And this is something I almost, I already said. Uh, so th this is almost like potential difference. This is almost like potential difference, but there is no single potential with J uh, such that this is written as a difference. This is the precise meaning that this F is a non-conservative force. Okay, so now, uh, so this is our detail 
local detail balance condition for case two. Uh, this is our local detail balance condition for case one. Now uh, we can discuss relaxation to non-equilibrium steady states. So uh, in part two, page 34, so let's go back to part two. Oh, uh, whoops, sorry. This is page 34. So we uh, we discussed this convergence theorem. And basically, the only condition for this convergence theorem is that this transition rate matrix R is irreducible. Irreducibility means that you can go from any state to any any different state. So we, we did assume that, that omega connects all states. So the condition, the irreducibility for this convergence theorem is satisfied. So we have this statement very strong statement. Uh, we know that there is a unique probability distribution PS that satisfies this equation. And this is a steady stationary distribution and it satisfies this. And most importantly, uh, you can start from any initial distribution, but if you wait for sufficiently long time, you will reach this PS. And so we uh, interpret that this PS, the stationary distribution, uh, describes the probability distribution of the non-equilibrium steady state in this case. And what is non-equilibrium steady states? Let go, let's go back to part zero, the very beginning. And so suppose that you start from the equilibrium state of something like, well, this can be a water or like a metal or whatever, and you place it in you you yeah, you place it, it in touch with two different heat paths. They are very large heat paths with cold temperature and hot temperature. Okay. And initially, I don't know what will happen. It depends on the initial state of the system. But anyway, something very non-equilibrium happens. And after, if you wait for sufficiently long time, and but you still assume that the heat paths are huge and their temperatures are the same. So after a sufficiently long time, you will reach a steady state, steady state in which, first of all, the system forgets about the initial condition. Okay. What, whatever initial condition it has, it reaches the same steady state in which uh, there is a steady heat, flow of heat from hot heat paths to the cold heat path through our system. Okay. So this is called a non-equilibrium steady state, NES. And recall that equilibrium state is macroscopically characterized characterized by the fact that there are no changes and all, no flows. But in this case, in this case, there are no changes, but there is a flow. There is a constant steady flow from steady flow of energy of heat from hot to cold. So this is a typical NES, okay? So in this case, uh, our system describes the environment, uh, which is non-equilibrium because of the temperature difference or the non-conservative force. And we have proved that the system reaches a unique, unique steady state. So this means that the, st the states, the system forgets about its in initial state and state and approaches here. So we can safely conclude that this describes a nest, the nest in this situation. And so this, uh, we have observed, made this similar observation for equilibrium environment case. And we can, we also prove this, we also use this general theorem. But in that case, uh, please recall that we knew much more about this PS. We knew that this is precisely the canonical distribution. That was a very important message. And, but in this case, we have, this existence theorem, we do have uniqueness theorem. We don't. We do know about this positivity, but that's all. We do not have any general results for of, about the precise form of this PS. We know that this PS exists, but we do not know what it is. And similarly for the H theorem, uh, from part two thirty five, we know that there is an H function. This is not. The this is not the entropy or this is not the Hamiltonian, this is the H function. The H function, uh, at the, oh, this should be HP of T, sorry. Uh, this should be HP of T. Uh, this HP of T as a function of time uh, decreases monotonically and finally reaches zero. We know that. So we do know, in this case too, we, we know that there is a well-defined function HP and it's, it's, mo it's monotonically decreases to zero as time goes to infinity. Very good. But 
Uh, again, recall that in the case of equilibrium environment, we knew that this HP is the generalized Helmholtz free energy. Okay? But in this case, we do know, we know that there is a function, but we don't know anything about this. So we have much less information here. Okay? Uh, in this equilibrium environment, the case of equilibrium environment, we could argue that, okay, so what, what this system is doing is trying to reduce this, uh, reduce, the, decrease this uh, generalized health whole tree energy and try to minimize it and to, to finally reach equilibrium state. That is the canonical distribution. But in this case, in this case of uh, non-equilibrium environment, we, we know that there is HP, but we don't have any any physical picture coming out of, out of this. So that's it's a very big difference. Okay, so now um, we want to discuss linear response relation after this, but this is just a preparation for this linear response relation. So uh, we want to, this This is basically the review of part two, page 45. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, this is page 45 of part two, where we discuss the expectation value of jump quantities. So, uh, these are basically copy from part two. So we want to summarize these results about expectation values. And th this is something new. And we want, and this will be very, very useful for the discussion of linear response relations. So we, we want to derive this. Okay, so, but before deriving this, it's easy, but we have to recall all these uh, symbols, which were complicated. So first of all, uh, we are interested in a, a in an asymmetric jump quantity. A jump quantity is a random quantity that takes value uh, when there is a jump, okay? And we further assume that this, our jump quantity is uh, asymmetric in the sense that if you switch this and this, uh, you get minus. Or well, here, J and K are different, of course. J and K are different. And uh, of course you can consider uh, any, I mean, a jump quantity name may not be asymmetric. Okay, but, but here we are interested in a symmetric one. And the uh, very natural expectation value of G is given by this. So we need a probability distribution P and this uh, transition rate, rates omega. And then this uh, here you have, this is the probability that you are in J and this is the probability per unit time. You have jump from J to K. So you multiply this with DG and sum over J and K. This is uh, the expectation value of G per unit time, okay? So we, we are interested in this kind of thing. And uh, it is very important, useful to consider the path quantity that corresponds to this G. And now it's a function of time and it takes in a time T and in path gamma, which is written like this, uh, this takes this value, okay? Uh, now this M, it's lowercase m counts these uh, jumps. Okay, so this m t m is the time at which uh, at which the mth jump takes place. So you sum over all jumps, and then you just uh, multiply this jump quantity and the delta function, and just sum over. Okay, since jump quantity takes value only when a jump takes place, uh, so it's natural that you have this delta function, and uh, for us, it is more important to consider this uh, time integrated path quantity, which is simply the time integration of this lowercase g hat hat. That's uppercase g hat hat. And this guy, it, it's not, doesn't depend on time anymore. And it depends only on gamma, the path. And in gamma, it takes value g uppercase g gamma. This is simply the time integration of this. This is much easier. You just integrated this over time. So you simply sum over all jumps and the corresponding jump quantities. And this is a very important equality, or yes, this is a very important equality about the path average. So you take this uh, path quantity uppercase g hat hat and take this path average starting from any initial state. And this is the collection of uh, transition rates. And of course, uh, by definition, this is this. Since this is this, this is simply the time integration of g hat hat. And uh, actually, let, let's go back to part two. In part two, page 45, we proved, we discussed this non-trivial non identity. Of course, this looks very plausible, 
And this looks very trivial if you understand the physics. And actually, it is trivial. But but the, I mean, the proof was a little bit complicated. But anyway, we do have this relation. You should have. And then uh, this can be written like this. And so this quantity, this, this path average of this time integrated quantity is written in this form. This is very important. This is very, very important for our purpose. Now, uh, let's go back to our present situation where this uh, mega tilde is stationary. And in this case, we know from the convergence theorem that starting from any P0, any initial distribution, uh, this expectation value at time t converges to this expectation value in steady state or uh, non-equilibrium non steady state. Why? Because, of course, this PT converges to PCS, okay? And then, of course, this expectation value converges to this. So uh, if you look at this time integral, then if this tau T is large enough, then this is basically this. So if you let tau to infinity, of course, you have to divide by pi. So if you divide everything by tau here and let tau go to infinity, then, uh, this becomes this. So uh, we get this identity for any initial distribution P0. And this is actually very important and this will be very useful. The left-hand side, here we have this uh, path quantity and this path average. And we are going to, then we are good at treating this kind of thing because we can make use of uh, the, all these fluctuation theorems. And on the right hand side, this is a more traditional quantity that you want to look at. Uh, this is, this says that you want, you are in steady state, non-equilibrium steady state, and you want to know the expectation value of a jump quantity. But probably you are interested in the expectation value of the current or something like that. And then it's given by this expectation value. And we know that this, this equality guarantees that instead of treating this expectation value, we can treat this uh, path average. And this will be very useful when we discuss linear response relations in the next video. Okay.